Thanks so much for checking out this message from LifeGate Church. We hope that God uses this message to encourage you and help you grow deeper in your faith. Let's pray and then we'll dive in. Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity to gather and this, this message that you placed in my heart. Father, I, I, I need your anointing today so that I may preach this clearly. And for everyone who's listening online and in the room, give us ears, hearts to hear from you. And as we pray for your Holy Spirit to come, that you would come in power and that you would bring power and purity to all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, friends, um, over my life, there's been a number of moments where I've had God moments or God encounters that have had a significant influence on my life. Um, I think back to when I was eight years old and sitting in a scripture class at Padstead Park Public School and the scripture teacher saying, if you want to become a Christian, stay at recess. And I remember that moment and I prayed a prayer to become a Christian. That was a significant moment. I remember at the age of 17 when I was at a youth conference up in Katoomba and I heard a guy speak and that's when the, the gospel made absolute sense to me. And there was this burning within my heart to share what Christ has done with, 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 with family and friends. And a, a significant moment in my life. Then at 24 years of age, I'm at Bible college and we're talking about baptism. And I, I grew up in a church that um, christened babies. They didn't um, encourage baptism for believers. They did it for babies. And so I, I worked out that the, um, Jesus says for you to believe, then get baptized. And I went, hang on a second. I didn't believe then get baptized. That was my parents' decision. So I remember going down to Cronulla Beach at the age of 24 and going under the waves and coming up out of that baptism, hugely significant moment. And like it says in 1 Peter 3, 21, your conscience is cleaned. That's how I felt in baptism. It was a beautiful moment. Another time um, when I was 22 years of age, another significant moment, and this is where I, I, want, us, I want to lead into the topic of today. Um, at the age of 22, I was heavily involved in church life. I was running the worship ministry, youth ministry in, in another church. And there was someone in the church who I respected, um, older than me, 20 years older than me, someone I looked up to, and he said, Nathan, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? And I said, have I what? And he goes, come to my house, we'll sort it out. And I, what are you talking about? I grew up in a church that, 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 that spoke about the Holy Spirit, but not a lot. And this, and this idea of baptism in the Holy Spirit, I didn't have a clue what that was about. No idea. Um, and so I went to his house and said, Nathan, what we're going to do, we're going to pray and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Um, so he pulled out a little prayer, like it was like a sinner's prayer, just to make sure I was a Christian. Um, went through the sinner's prayer, and then he pulled out his guitar, and we sang, and, and, we, and we said, come Holy Spirit. And it was a beautiful, beautiful moment where I sensed the Holy Spirit come. Um, I, I was given the gift of tongues on that day, um, and it was a, an, an incredible moment in my life. Now, what came out of that moment, and we can have these beautiful encounters with God, but what's most important is the fruit that comes out of it, right? From that moment, my relationship with God went to a whole new level, a whole new level of intimacy. I thought that you sang songs in church because we simply declared God's truth to one another, like it says in Colossians chapter 3. But I missed the other part of Colossians chapter 3 where it says, sing songs to the Lord. And so worship music became this, this opportunity for me and God to have this, to have this moment. And then when I opened his Bible up, it was like reading it all, all new and all fresh. And his words became, became alive to me. Not only that, this um, moment when I was prayed for to have a Holy Spirit encounter was that there was this change in my heart and desire that I just wanted to be pure and I wanted to be holy. This sin was like, well, what's that? I'm not interested. I just, I just want to honor God with my life. And then came over me this 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 incredible passion to share the message of Jesus with those who, who, who don't know him. An incredible moment. And I wonder if you have had a moment like that in your life, a moment like that. We're in a series entitled Encountering Jesus. And in this series, we've seen that Jesus is the most significant and influential character of all of, all of history, the, in, the most influential person of history. Our, our dates are divided into BC, before, he was before Christ, and AD in the year of our Lord. His teaching has laid the platform for our Western society. Although he lived over 2,000 years ago, 2 billion people claim to follow him. The Bible claims that he is the one who was risen from the dead. He's the most influential person in history. 
And this Jesus is described as the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. That is one of the descriptions. And this is an important theme in, in, in the New Testament. This, this description of Jesus being the baptizer in the Holy Spirit is in all four Gospels. It's in all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Compare that with Jesus' birth. Jesus births only in two. The account of his birth is in Matthew and it's in Luke. But this baptizer in the Holy Spirit is in all four. Lazarus risen from the dead in John chapter 11. That's only in one gospel. The uh, woman at the well in Samaria who had the five wives and her whole, whole, whole community got saved. That's only in one gospel. And yet this idea of Jesus being baptized in the Holy Spirit is in all four. So it's an important theme for us to look at. And, and not only does it describe Jesus as the baptizer in the Holy Spirit, it also tells us why. Why Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And as we look at the, the, uh, the uh, gospel writing and as we look at the book of Acts, we see two main reasons for it. The first is around purity. That when Jesus puts his Holy Spirit upon us, he changes our desires within us. He changes our passions, our longings, and our longing becomes less about self and pleasing the flesh and more about pleasing him. Purity. And the second thing we see around the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1, it's about power. That we are given the power and the passion and the ability and the boldness to be God's witnesses into the world. Why, why does Jesus baptize in the Holy Spirit? Two main reasons for purity and for power. So this morning I want to look at each one of these things. I want to start with purity. We see this idea of purity in Matthew chapter 3. It's, it's, it, it's a description that, that our John the Baptist gives of Jesus, the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist is out there baptizing for repentance, a different baptism that we have today. When we're baptized today, we're baptized into the name of Jesus, and we become like Jesus in his death, that we die to our old self, and new life, we, we are come alive living our new life to God, the born-again experience. Baptism for John wasn't like that. It was simply saying, this is an outward sign that I'm sorry, I'm repenting, and I'm going to live God's way, yeah? It's a bit of an aside. But John the Baptist is there baptizing, and, the religious, and people are coming to him to get baptized. And the religious leaders come to John the Baptist and say, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? What authority do you have? Hey, brother, welcome. Good to have you here. Um, it's Grant just walked in. We just prayed for you, brother Grant. We just prayed for you, and then you walk in the room. We didn't pray that you would enter. We just prayed for you, brother. Welcome. Um, that was a distraction, wasn't it? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. They, the religious leaders go to John the Baptist and say, why are you doing what you're doing? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that the Old Testament talks about? And John the Baptist says, no, no, no. It's not me. There's one coming. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. He's going to come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and, building up the char- and ga- burning up the chaff, with unquenchable fire. In this passage, John describes Jesus as the one who's going to baptize in the Holy Spirit. The word baptize simply means to immerse. Like we're immersed in water, Jesus is the one who's going to immerse you in the Holy Spirit. And then he has this interesting description of what this baptism is going to look like. He talks about a farmer who has harvested his crops and he's taken the crop to a threshing floor, a large rock, or sometimes on the roof of the houses that had flat roofs. And then he would get a fork, and he would get the harvest and throw it up into the air. I've got a picture for you. And, the, and as he threw it up in the air, the grain and the chaff, the leftover stuff, would separate. Some of the chaff would be blown away by the wind, the light stuff, but the heavy stuff would come and land, and the, the chaff, like it says in the picture, they would collect it, bundle it up, and then burn it, because that's no good. Because what's, cause, cause what's good is the grain. And John the Baptist gives this description of the Spirit, because that's what the Spirit does. When the Spirit comes upon you, when you're immersed, when you're filled with the Spirit, He changes your passions. He changes your desires. You, you, you desire purity. You desire holiness. You desire to live the life that God wants you to live. The Holy Spirit coming upon you. Now, Jesus... 
um, gave us the perfect example of living a holy life. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin. It describes Jesus as someone who has never sinned and that he became sin for us, that we may become the righteousness of God. I uh, won't go into all that, but to say simply that Jesus had no sin. And the New Testament says that we as Christians are to live a life where sin is no part in our lives. Look at 1 Peter. It says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy, be separate, be set apart from the world, be different from the world in all that you do. For it's written, Be holy because I am holy. And that's talking about God. Be holy just like God is holy because he is holy. That's how he wants us to live. Colossians 3 says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to the earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. And then in verse 12, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself or put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. The Bible is clear that as Christians, God wants us to put off our old sin, flesh, nature, put down sin, and put on love, godliness, holy, purity. He wants us to put it on, and that's a choice. And as we go about life, God wants us to deliberately choose holiness and purity and think about how he wants me to live in this situation, and slowly, slowly we'll be transformed. But if you want to fast-track your purity... If you want to fast track that transformation, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. Ask Jesus to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Because when he he comes, he can do in you in seconds what you can spend months and even years transforming in your own abilities and choices. Jesus can come like that by the power of his spirit and bring transformation to your life. I, um, I used to have... I'm not used to, I still do. When I cut my grass at home, um, I get the edger, I, I, I mow the edges, then I, then I get the, the whippersnipper, and then I whippersnip the edges. And then rather than just get the lawnmower and blow stuff everywhere and get the, and get the little grass back into the track where I've done the edging, because then it fills up with dirt and it's harder to cut next time, I used to get the broom and I used to sweep all the grass to a place all the way around, then get a shovel. And then get the shovel and the broom and scoop it up and then put it in the auto bin and then, I would mow, and then I'd mow the grass. But then, wow, this was huge in my life. I then bought this little sucker, a Makita blower. And let me tell you, this thing, huh? It does both. It's a sucker, but it also blows. It's set up as a blower. And sometimes I suck it depending on how much there is, but other times I blow it, right? And let me tell you how much faster and how much better it is when you get this sucker going, feel that. Can you feel the power? Can you feel that going on there? That's like the difference. Did you feel that? That's like the difference between doing it yourself time after time and getting the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. There's the difference. The Holy Spirit's like the engine. It's like the powerhouse that changes stuff. Real fast, real quick. Um, There's a movie that's come out. It's called Fast and Furious 9 recently. I haven't seen the movie. But here's a picture of uh, Fast and Furious movie number one. And there's a scene where this undercover... If you know the movie, it's about about these bad dudes that race cars and steal stuff. And there's an undercover copper who who joins them and tries to catch them. Anyway, to to, to gain approval, the undercover copper's in this green car. and And he does this street race, right? And he's driving along and he's coming last... And then he presses this nitro button, right? Now, nitro is a chemical that you put in your fuel. Apparently, I'm talking about engines again. I know I'm in very great, very difficult territory here for a pastor. But you put this chemical in the fuel, and what it does, it makes the uh, fuel burn hotter and faster, which makes the RPMs rev more, which give you more power. So he's driving along, and he's coming last, and he presses the nitro button, and all of a sudden, whoom! And then he presses it again, and and then he blows up his engine. Beside the point... The Holy Spirit is like the nitro button. It's the power. It's the turbo. It's the come, God, and do something quickly. Transform my life. Move quickly. Move powerfully in my life. It's like the engine, the supercharged turbo engine that, God can, that we can spend months transforming and 
and asking God to move us and change us and, and deliberately making choices. And we will be transformed by doing that, renewing our minds. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is so that you can have purity. When he comes upon you, he changes your desires, your mindsets, what you want. Why does, the Holy, why does Jesus baptize in the Holy Spirit? The first thing is about purity. The second thing is around power. Let's look at the second one around power. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, Jesus talks about it in Acts chapter 1. In, Acts, in the book of Acts, Acts is the continuation or the second part of the book of Luke. The guy who wrote the, the gospel of Luke also wrote Acts. And commentators thought, often talk about Luke, Acts. And in the beginning of Acts, we, we, we uh, have this. I'm going to read you eight verses. This is Luke writing to a guy named Philophilus. In my former book, Philophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he, Jesus, was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, wait, because in a few days you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered, then they gathered around him excuse me, and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive, here it is, power. The Greek word is dunamis, where we get our word dynamite. You receive dynamite, power, when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The second part of the Jesus coming, the Holy Spirit coming upon us, is for power to be his witnesses. You know, as a church, we often talk about, um, we often talk about, Sharing our faith because we need to. The Bible's full of it. I just read it the other day. I um, reading my Bible yesterday and in Mark chapter 5. Um, Jesus heals someone. He says, now go and tell. Go and tell. And the guy just went and told what all, all that Jesus has done for him. And as a church, we talk about taking people through foundations one-on-one. -on -one, and I still encourage you to do that. We talk about sharing our testimony. This is what God has done in my life. We, we, we encourage you to, to build relationships, to get in the community, to invite them. And, 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 and we need to be deliberate in, in, to, to, to do those things. But sometimes those things can be scary. Sometimes we can have fear. How are they going to treat me? What if they reject me? And we can sometimes lack a boldness. Here. The baptism in the Spirit, the immersing in the Spirit, is to give you power or boldness or passion or enthusiasm or strength or courage, whatever word you put on it, to, in, to, to move you towards witnessing. So when you are filled with the Spirit, witnessing isn't so scary anymore. There's actually a desire within you to share the message of Jesus because God has touched you. He's, power, he's touched your life. He's moved in your heart and given you a desire to share your faith. Back in, um, what year is it? Back in 2014, Carl, I bought a boat. You ready for my boat? Here it is. Uh, not really, not really. Here's, here's the uh, true boat I bought. I paid 1800 bucks for it. Ross helped me buy it. Thanks for that, Ross. And I had an old Suzuki 25-horsepower uh, motor on it, and, 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 it went, and it went all right. And then um, Michelle and I are up our favorite holiday destination, and we've taken the boat out, and we're about two kilometers from the boat ramp, and all of a sudden, the, the uh, motor stops, and I can't get, it, can't get it going. So here's a picture that my uh, wife took of me uh, dragging the boat back two kilometers through the water, and some of it was shallow, some of it meant swimming, some of it meant getting back into the boat and paddling across the channel, and then pulling it, trying to miss the stingrays as I was walking along the bottom. Um, but then we uh, got rid of that motor, and then we, we uh, put this new Yamaha 25 horsepower motor on it. Woof! And it's lighter. And let me tell you, the boat screams. When it's like glassy and it's just me in the boat, it's almost scary. It goes so quick. It's, and it's a little tinny. I mean, you know, it's not even that scary, but scary for me. 
this thing flies. And the reason I tell you that story is because the, the vast difference of me trying to pull that boat along in, my, in just doing, doing what was necessary and then getting a motor, it's like the difference between us sharing our faith um, out of our own strength and out of our own, uh, like, yes, God, I'm going to do it out of obedience compared to when the Holy Spirit fills you and empowers you and gives you a desire and gives you a passion to share your faith. It's, it's radically different. I, I brought some um, other, other things, other analogies to show you. I grew up with a, with a father who only used screwdrivers. And, and then when he'd drill a hole and then he'd get a screw and then eventually screw it in. And then I introduced him to these things. Yeah, come on. The power, the call, the drill. So much better. And then an, another example of these, you never had to cut. You ever had to cut a piece of timber with a handsaw? And then you pull this sucker out and you go, oh my goodness, how much easier is this? Who knows what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah you know what I'm talking about. The, uh, the uh, difference the power makes. And I, and, and I show you these analogies because this is, like, well, this, is, this, is, this is what happens when we're immersed, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. When we are radically, God does stuff. God changes stuff. It's, 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 it's radically different. Why does Jesus baptize in the Holy Spirit? Number one, for purity. Number two, for power. Now, let me say this. Throughout God's church, there's lots of different understandings of how, when the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens. Some people believe it happens at, um, at conversion. As soon as you commit your life to Jesus, you're baptized in the Spirit. Other people think it's distinct. Um, for me, like, I, I don't really matter. I'm not, I'm not too concerned about when it happens, as long as it happens, because <laughs> it's so important. In Acts chapter 8, we have um, Philip, the evangelist, going into Samaria. And he preaches the message of Jesus, and, he, and, there, and there's many healings and many wonders, and people get saved. And then a few weeks or even months later, Peter and John turn up. And then Peter and John lay hands on these believers, and they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. That was, that was a moment where they got saved and then filled with the Spirit some weeks or even months later. Then you've got Acts chapter 10, where Philip's in Cornelius' house, and he's preaching the gospel, and all of a sudden... It, it doesn't even say they believe, but it's like the believing in the baptism of the Spirit happens at the exact same time. They're in there together, and as Peter preaches, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. They fill with the Spirit, prophesy, speak in tongues, and it's like the believing in the baptized of the Spirit happens at the same time. In Acts chapter 19, Paul's in Ephesus, and he finds some people who were disciples of John, and he told them about Jesus. He presents the gospel they believe. They get baptized in water. And then Paul lays his hands on them in verse 6, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. There, it seems like it all happens within a few minutes. It's interesting that in the book of Acts, the apostles regularly prayed for people to be filled with the Spirit. Why? Because they knew the importance of it. And whether or not it happened then or there, or we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's not just a one-off occurrence. If you look at the book of Acts, you see the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came. But then you go back to the end of John, and Jesus breathes on his disciples. And then in Acts chapter 4, it talks about when they were praying, the whole place was shaken, and they were filled with the Spirit. And you have someone like Stephen, who's before the, before the religious leaders, and he's being challenged for his faith. It says that he was filled with the Spirit. Over and over again, these apostles, early, early Christians, were filled with the Spirit. In Ephesians 5.18, it says, be filled with the Spirit, and it's written in the present continuous tense, meaning be filled with the Spirit, not just once, but go on being filled, and go on being filled, and go on being filled. Be continually filled with the Spirit. Why? Because we need greater purity in our life. Because we need greater power. And those experiences of the Spirit, it's not like you have these encounters and you change for a while, but it's like the Spirit lifts, or I don't know what happens, but we don't stay in that place. We need to be continually filled with His Spirit to continually have passion to share our faith, have a desire for purity, a desire for holiness. So as we come to the end of this message, if I ask you this, do you need greater purity in your life? What's the obvious answer? Yes. Now you can work on renewing your mind, you can make good choices and that's great and we should be doing those things. But let me, let me encourage you to ask Jesus to fill you, immerse you, baptize you, same word, with his spirit because he changes you in instance. 
Who needs a greater boldness, a greater passion to be a witness for Jesus? Who needs greater power? Let me encourage you to get filled with his Holy Spirit. Get baptized in his Spirit because that's what his Holy Spirit does. So how do we do this? Simply, you need to desire it. You need to want it. You need to be a Christian. That's super important. The baptism of the Spirit is for Christians, people who put their faith and their trust in Jesus. You need to ask Jesus for it. He's the one who baptizes. And finally, I want to say this baptism in the Spirit is is not based on your ability or your goodness. It's Jesus who baptizes out of his mercy and his grace. You don't have to perform to get it. You just need to receive. So as we come to the end of this message, I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. I'm going to invite Matt to put some music on. And we're going to pray for you to be filled with the Spirit if you'd like that. We're not going to force anyone. We don't force anyone in this church. But we're going to have the prayer team at the front. And if you would like us to pray for you, to lay hands on you, that God would fill you with his Holy Spirit, we've got about 10 minutes till 10 o'clock. We're going to invite you to come forward and we're going to pray. So prayer team, come on down now. If you're watching this online, as we close this service, I encourage you to pray where you are and say, Jesus, fill me with your Holy Spirit and see what he does. It's a beautiful thing. Thanks for joining us online. We're going to say goodbye to you. God bless you. Thanks so much for checking out this message. LifeGate Church has people meeting in person and online in many different locations, and we'd love to help you get connected. My name is Andrew and I lead our online team here at LifeGate Church and it's our job to do exactly that. We'd love to support you, uh, help you get connected and find out how you can take your next steps. So why don't you head to lifegate.org.au slash online and we'd love to find out more about you and how we can serve you as a church. Thanks for checking out this message and we'll catch you soon.